Good morning, Forefront. First and foremost, I want you to know that Forefront fully, fully and unequivocally supports our black siblings in our fight to end state-sanctioned murder. And I also want you to know Forefront unequivocally supports reform uh, over a law that disproportionately affects our black and indigenous, indigenous and other people of color. Well, those are our siblings, and we unequivocally support you. And so the question is why? You know, why do we support you? <laughs> <laughs> this is biblical. It's not because we're political and it's not because we're just another organization. This is absolutely biblical. In fact, when God gets what God wants, God gets this wonderful uprising. God gets this wonderful revolution. God gets jubilee. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about biblical precedent for everything we're going through. This is this is jubilee. There is hope in the midst of this. And so what happens is this, in, in the book of Exodus, Israel is freed, and they're freed from, from bondage, and they're in bondage to Egypt. And being in bondage to Egypt, they, they are, are let go, and, uh, you know, ten plagues happen, and a, and a river parts, or a, a sea parts, and, and they're brought into freedom, and God says, you know, you were once in bondage. And at this point, I want you to understand that you are now um, uh, my child. You are now married to me. And if you're married to me, there's a new kind of bond that we have. And this new kind of bond is this. You are now completely and utterly free, which means you are always brought into equity. And it means you are always, always brought into flourishing. And it means that you are always, always brought into love. Those three things. And then God says this, I want to make sure that this happens. I got to make sure that this keeps going. So what I'm going to tell you is once a week, I want you to practice Sabbath. Once a week, I want you to go ahead and I want you to make sure not only you heal your body and heal yourself, and not only do you rest, but that people who have less than you, servants, uh, you know, people who are maybe still enslaved, people who are refugees, people who are foreigners, let them eat from your land. Because not only are you free, but they are free as well. And when I get what I want, I see everybody having enough. I see equity for everyone. I see flourishing for everyone. And what I love is that the people of Israel, they step up. And they're like, yeah, we'll do this. In fact, as Jesus shows us a little later, sometimes they do it a little too well. Okay, that's fine. But then God ups the ante. And God says, hey, you know that Sabbath, Sabbath that we do once a week? We're actually going to do this Sabbath once every seven years as well. And instead of just resting for the day, I want you to rest for a year for all the same reasons. Because in my kingdom, in my economy, in, in, in my when I get what I want, everybody has enough. Everyone is brought into equity. There is no more hierarchy. And so once every seven years, you're going to stop working because working brings power and we're going to stop it. And we're going to ask you to, to heal, for your land to heal, and anybody that does not have enough, we're going to ask them to go ahead and take whatever they need so that they are brought into equity and flourishing. And the people of Israel are like, okay, all right, this is cool, I can I can do it. And then, and then God goes completely bonkers, and this is the best part, because then God goes, and here's what else I'm going to tell you, every 50 years, I want you to give back whatever property you have bought or, or maybe even taken. I want you to give it back to the person who owned it before you. I want you to give it back to that family. Any debts that are outstanding, I want you to cancel all of those debts. Anytime that there is someone who is in prison for a nonviolent offense, and that was usually debt in those days, I want you to let them out of prison. I want you to set captives free. And anytime anybody needs any part of your property, I want you to give it to them because in my economy, in my kingdom, when I get what I want, freedom is flourishing and freedom is equity and freedom makes sure that there's nobody crippled by debt or saddled by hurt or there's nobody that's less than. That's what I get when I, that's what I get when, when I get what I want. That's what God tells the Israelites. And so what ends up happening? Well, some of the Israelites are like, well, God, can I just do this on my own? Isn't this something that, you know, personally, I can go ahead and, and make this the case? And God basically says, no, individual absolution never, ever leads to societal change. We are an, an inescapable reality of mutual connection. And because you are a mutual connection, you will enact this for one another. And so what does history tell us? History tells us that it rarely happened. It rarely happened. Why did it rarely happen? 
It rarely happened because we've decided to put people in power and those people like to keep their power. That's why it rarely happened. It's really difficult to ask people to give up their power. And so we didn't see people give up their power in that time. And unfortunately, thousands of years later, we are still in a place where there is a hierarchy with people who refuse to give up power. So what ends up happening? Well, we see things like Jubilee. We say, well, when God gets what God wants, uh, I, yeah, I can, I can enact Jubilee. And then what we do is we give, we give crumbs. We give crumbs, those of us in power. I was relayed a story this week about Frederick Douglass. And after uh, African people who had been enslaved were quote unquote set free, uh, someone said to, to Frederick Douglass, they said, well, you should be happy. Aren't you happy at this point? And Frederick Douglass says, I won't be happy until I'm the president of the United States, at which point people literally laughed in his face, effectively saying, those of us in power have already given you enough. You're free. Shouldn't you just be thankful for that? Right? And this week on social media, I see the exact same thing happening. You know, I see a lot of people that look like myself, a lot of white people with privilege coming out of the woodwork to condemn the murder of George Floyd. And that's that's great. That's great. But all too often, I'm seeing people in power, people like myself saying, well, we finally showed up. We're here. What's everybody complaining about? You know, we, we've made it completely dismissing the fact that our siblings of color have been running this exhausting, exhausting marathon way longer than anyone in power. And so when people of color have said, this has been going on for literally centuries, and we're sitting there going, but we're here now, aren't we? No, that's just us keeping our power. That is us maintaining our hierarchy. That is us refusing to believe that we are mutually interconnected, and that is us not enacting the jubilee that God intends. And I would love to say it's not happening in the church, but it's happening in the church as well. It's happening in our church as well. It's happening with me as well. The truth of the matter is, is that I say things like, and we say things like, oh, but, but well, I just rather, I just rather have a personal relationship. I see that God is calling us to equity, and I see that God is calling us to give out power, and I, and I see that God is calling uh, to make sure that we all are flourishing, but I really just need to focus on me and my personal relationship, because that's going to help me do my best. And when people say that, and when I say that, what I'm hearing is that I'm not ready to give up my power. I'm still a part of this hierarchical system, and I want to stay in that system because I'm uncomfortable moving out of that system. So I'm going to hide behind the idea of a personal relationship with Jesus in order to, instead of affecting and infecting change through our God-ordained call to bring Jubilee. And that ends. Now, I think personal relationships with Jesus are incredibly important. In fact, I have one, and I'm glad I have one, and I'm glad I get to pray, and I'm glad that the Holy Spirit is working in me. But if that's all my Christianity is, I am missing the point completely. We are called to bring jubilee. We are called to end the hierarchy and bring equity and flourishing for others. And if that means some are giving up power at the expense of others, that is a, or, or I'm sorry, for the, for the benefit of others— and that's exactly what we do. That is Jubilee. And here's what I love about Jubilee. I'm going to tell you what I love about it. I love the fact that it did happen from time to time. And you know when Jubilee happened? Jubilee happened when there was protest. And Jubilee happened when there was uprising. Because that was the beginning. That was the beginning of voices being made heard. That was the beginning of people saying, wow, there is a way in which I need to give up power for the sake of others. And that is when Jubilee happens. You see, Jubilee is an uprising. It is a protest. It is a movement to bring God's kingdom to this place. And this is what we get to do, church. We get to bring Jubilee. It's such a difficult time right now. Right now, I know that so many are tired. And right now, I know that there are so many of us exhausted because, because we're dealing with a pandemic on top of everything, and we don't know what's going to happen next. And what I love is that when you do a little bit of research, historically speaking, this is the time. This is the time to bring Jubilee. The writer Rebecca Solnit, she says this. She says, horrible in itself. Disaster is sometimes a door back into paradise. That paradise, at least in which we are, in which we are who we hope to be. 
to do the work we desire, and to be each of our sisters and brothers keepers. There is precedent for us not to go back to normal. There is precedent for us to enact Jubilee. I love Medium. Any of y'all read me like everything on Medium? It is a treasure trove. And somebody posted an incredible article on the Black Plague, saying that when the Black Plague happened, all inequity uh, was protested. And there was an uprising around it, and it led to drastic cutbacks in the amount of power religious organizations had and the amount of power that lords had over commoners. In fact, it set up what was considered to be a, a, an incredible brand new pay, pay system that brought people out of poverty and into a place where they could actually live. The precedent is there. We do not have to go back to normal. And church, I have zero interest in going back to normal. We keep saying, when, are, well, when we go back to normal, no, when we go back into physical space, not when we go back to normal. Going back to normal means that, that people of color are, are disproportionately dying over lack of resources because of this virus. I do not want to go back to normal. I don't want to go back to normal where state-sanctioned violence happens to our black and indigenous and people of color and people of color over and over and over again with nothing done about it. I do not want to go back to normal. I don't want to go back to normal where we where we say that the CEO is is the the head of everything and the one to be revered while our first responders and our delivery people and our and our our, our grocery store workers get nothing. I don't want to go back to normal. We have seen in the past 2 months that, that that it's our first responders and our delivery people and our and our workers that are the ones that need to be revered. I don't want to go back to normal. I don't want to go back to normal where we are up to our eyeballs in debt. There is zero reason that this should put any of us in significant debt. It does not have to be like this. It doesn't have to be normal. And I do not want to go back to a place where we live out some sort of scarcity mentality, where there are cycles of poverty with little chance of breaking free. No, we get to enact Jubilee. We get to be a part of an uprising. We get to be part of a protest. We get to say that when God gets what God wants, God wants the end of hierarchy and equity and flourishing for all. Church, we are going to enact Jubilee. We've continued to enact Jubilee. So here's what I want to say to you, church. Some of y'all are exhausted, and some of y'all have been running this marathon for a long time, and some of you all can't do this anymore. And to you, I say you are safe in this place, and you are safe at our church, and we want to bring rest, and we want to bring a, a sense of peace, and we are going to do our best to be empathetic. We have a care team that is here to help you. Our staff is here to help you, and when I call us to action and when I call us to Jubilee, maybe the first step we take is some of us with power— Give give those who, who have worked hard and who have been working hard, maybe we give them a bit of rest and we pick up the mantle and maybe we become accomplices working at the direction of those who are tired so that we can enact Jubilee. Maybe that's the place we start. If you are tired, we see you. We want to be with you. We want to help you. For those of us who are just starting, let's get to work. Let's enact Jubilee. You know, like Angela said, and I'm so glad that she said it before, it's one thing to start the uprising. It's one thing to start the protest. And I'm thankful for my forefront community and our forefront community who has been out there on the front lines doing just that. And just know this, we are here for you and we are with you. And if you get in trouble for any reasons, we're going to bail you out. All right. You have that promise. OK, you have that promise for, from us. And if there are other people that need help, give to the community bail fund. It's a super easy thing to do. Go do that right now. In fact, I don't know if we have a link. We'll find one and we'll post it. That's the first thing that we can do. But like Angela said, it's going to go beyond our protests. It's going to go beyond our uprisings. We get the chance to enact Jubilee every time that we call our local council people, every time we call our local lawmakers, every time we, we call our Congress people, every single time we say, we call, and we just simply leave a message and say, what are you doing to bring about reform to state-sanctioned violence? What are you doing be, about the fact that a disproportionate number of people of color are being killed at the hands of law enforcement? What are you doing? What are you doing? And we get to do that. And in doing that, like Angela said, that enacts change. At the very least, if they're not doing anything, we get the chance to show up and say that we are not going to vote for you again. We get to vote. We get to, we get to call our, our lawmakers. We get to do those things. We can organize around that, and that enacts jubilee. That 
changes and shifts the hierarchy. It creates equity and it allows for all of us to flourish full stop. You know, in the past two months, uh, there are 50% less carbon emissions in New York City. Nature is healing itself, as we all joke around and say, especially with the boots on the subway platform. That one was my favorite. Nature is healing itself. What if we enacted nature to continue to heal itself? Just like Angela said before, what if we went and we went back to those same council people and lawmakers and said, what are you doing to protect uh, our climate? What are you doing when, when our government is rolling back climate protection? Are you stepping up? Are you speaking on our behalf? Again, we get to enact this and this is where we get to play a part. This is where we also get to say, hey, I'm going to commit to resting. I'm going to commit to lowering my carbon footprint. I'm going to commit to this. And again, we don't do it because it's political. We do it because it is what God ordains. It is the uprising. It is the protest of Jubilee. And we are longing for Jubilee. You know, Forefront, we have raised almost $23,000 $23,000 to help people directly in need. I'm so glad that we've been able to do that. And one of the ways that we're committed to helping others, we are committed to helping others by paying down medical debt. Now we've given to our community partners, we've given to people in need, but we recognize that 66% of people who file for bankruptcy do so because of medical debt. 25% of people in severe credit card uh, uh, debt, they are in that debt because of medical expenses. We have the chance to end that. We are partnering with an organization called RIP Medical Debt. And what that organization does is for every dollar that gets donated, $100 of debt gets canceled, which means a $1,000 donation cancels $100,000 in debt. We enact Jubilee by doing that. It is an uprising. It is a protest that brings equity and flourishing and all that God intends. That is what we get the chance to do. Church family, we have work to do. We have work to do. We have a hierarchy to end. We have flourishing to bring in. We have equity to bring in. We have freedom to get in because when God gets what God wants, God gets uprising and protest and God gets jubilee. And God calls us to that. That's what ushers in the kingdom. And that's what ushers in the next 500 years. That's what ushers it in, y'all. And we can do it. <sighs> Lastly, and I love this quote, Marva Dawn, a writer, says, Worship is a royal waste of time. I love that quote. Worship is a royal waste of time. And no, it's not what you think it means. What, what the writer Marva Dawn is saying is saying that it is an act of protest in itself. It is an act of uprising in itself when you declare that you have freedom enough to gather with a bunch of other people who have no business being together for the most part and saying that we are going to worship our God. There is something beautiful about enacting that freedom, about declaring that we together as a community are going to waste time. We are not going to be beholden to anybody. We are not going to have to work at the behest of anybody. We are going to waste time worshiping a God together who sees us all as God's unequivocally beautiful, made in God's image children. And we will waste time together declaring that for one another and to one another. And we will waste time declaring that the hierarchy ends and equity begins. We will waste time bringing in this jubilee because it's what God intends. And over and over, like I say, we do not do this. We don't do it because we're political. We don't do it because we're just another org. We do this because it changes things. It makes a difference because it brings the jubilee that God intends. And so I'm going to call us to follow those links. There's a bunch of them being posted right now. Go ahead and click on them. Click on them and do your part. And if you're tired, I'm going to call on you to rest. And some of us, others who aren't tired, will pick up the pace for you. But we're going to do this because we're called the Jubilee. We're going to do this because we believe that the death and resurrection and the ministry of Jesus Christ is where we plant our flag. It is where we live. It is the most important thing. We center our lives around it. We do it because, as Rebecca Solnit continues to say, if paradise now rises in hell, it is because of the suspension of the usual order and the failure of the most systems, and that we now get to be free and live and act 
in another way. Let's act in that other way. Let's live out the ministry of Jubilee. When Jesus grew up, I don't know how old he was, maybe 30 or so, he started a ministry. And we're lucky enough to have the first words recorded from Jesus's ministry. We're lucky enough to be able to read them. And I want to read them to us today because this is what Jesus said. This is what Jesus' entire ministry is based upon. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of Jubilee. And then Jesus rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, today, this day, scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And may scripture be fulfilled in our hearing today. And may we end hierarchy, bring equity, and bring flourishing, and enact what God gets what God wants, and which is jubilee. And so I just end by praying, and by praying this simple line, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. And may it be so for us today. Amen and amen and amen. Forefront, we're so glad that you're able to worship with us today. Um, we have